This video is brought to you by Clip Studio Paint. This is the worst piece I've made in my entire life. 2010. DeviantArt was somewhat new. Some people were posting cool dragon concept art and 13-year-old Shala was inspired to make something epic. About an hour later, this abomination was on his computer monitor and he wasn't feeling good about it. Today is the day when I'll finally remake it in Clip Studio Paint. I'll be highlighting some key lessons I've learned over these 12 years and some cool features of Clip Studio Paint that helped me create this upgraded piece. Let's dive right in. First, let's make a thumbnail. And that's the first lesson. This is the first lesson I'll highlight today. Thumbnailing working within a frame. So this forces you to think about how the elements of the scene are positioned, putting you in composition mode basically immediately. Now, I didn't know anything about composition when I made this whole drawing, but doing this can ensure you won't waste time polishing something that wasn't working from the get-go. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, there's not too much elements that I'm able to keep from the original apart from the red and gray color scheme. I can only add things on top of that. The main addition here will be a simple background to give this character some context. Now, first of all, I thought it would look cool if he was chilling on top of like a sharp cliff against a red, cloudy, dramatic ass sky with some gray fog. While thumbnailing, I'm very aware of the shape language of the composition. Here, everything is kind of diagonal and pointy, which creates a lot of movement around the image. You almost move in a circle or like a spiral. With the composition locked in, it was time to actually design the dragon himself. To warm up for this, I decided to make some quick studies of various dragon heads. <laughs> Lesson number two. Studying versus copying. What I'm doing here is not just copying images. I'm being very mindful of the forms and elements that make up these dragon heads. This was something my young self was not aware of. I could copy images already back then, but it didn't do much for my imaginative drawing skills because I was just mindlessly copying what I saw and drawing from reference. Anyway, when I got to the real deal, I realized that the heads ended up playing a smaller role than I thought, as most of the design weight of the dragon is actually on the body. To save time, I skipped detailing it with scales and such at this stage, as this sketch would just serve as guidance for me when I'm constructing the dragon on the real canvas. To my 13 year old self, drawing was just one activity. In reality, there are different head spaces you'll be in depending on the task. And here, the main focus is on designing a single thing. I'm doing the thinking here, so I won't have to do it again on the real canvas later. This is the difference between a concept artist and an illustrator, for example, which are both drawing jobs, but with different aims. So now, on to being an illustrator. This will be the final canvas. I imported the thumbnail and scaled it up, then started tweaking the dragon's pose by just painting a rough silhouette while having the design sketch open in the sub view window, which basically is just a reference viewer inside Clip Studio Paint. Simply drag and drop your reference here and you'll get the standard navigation controls like flipping, rotating. If you drag in multiple images, you can switch between them with these arrows over here. And if you drag in a clip file, you can just press open image on canvas to make edits to it and it'll automatically update when you save the file. The idea was to have him standing upright on hind legs and roaring over the valley below. Quite rough, but I just kept it like this for the time being while I take care of the other elements. I promise it won't look as bad as this. So next, it was time to figure out the logic behind the cliff as I just had a silhouette but no real form. To assist my brain with figuring it out, I downloaded some free 3D models from Sketchfab via a Blender add-on and combined them into my desired shape through some small editing. I exported the result as an FBX file. You can import 3D models with ease by just dragging the file onto your canvas and boom! I was then able to control the model's position, rotation and field of view with ease to match it with the silhouette that I had drawn. It helped me get a feel for the overall shapes and allowed me to more easily get an idea of how the rocks will be positioned in 3D space later. Drawing can be thought of as 
3D modeling with a pencil on a paper. What you're really doing when drawing anything is breaking it down to the simple forms that make it up. The better trained you are at this, the easier it will be to handle tasks like lighting and shading. To my 13 year old self though, drawing was just putting lines in a canvas and wasn't really much deeper than that. <laughs> Now that this was out of the way, it was time to get rid of this horrendous dragon silhouette and actually draw him out with lines. Oh, yeah, yeah. Lesson five. If there's one thing I've learned over the last five years is that you shouldn't be afraid to restart something when it's not working. Within the reason, of course. And that's exactly what I did here. I restarted the dragon sketch. This isn't necessarily drawing advice, but just general advice. It can be applied to any type of work, basically. Just to don't get too attached to what you're making. You know what I mean? The first sketch allowed me to basically detect what the main issues would be so that I could avoid making the same mistakes in the second sketch. As far as details, I didn't feel like sketching scales and such out by hand, even on this sketch. I thought it would be smarter to do that via painting later. Now that the sketch is done, it's time to create a color mask. So this is quite easy in Clip Studio Paint by using the magic wand tool. Tweak the area scaling slider here, which expands or or reduces the size of your selection, allowing the edge of the selection to go perfectly behind the middle of your lines. We'll select everything outside of the character, then invert the selection. It's also not an issue if you have like small gaps somewhere in your lines. That will be taken care of when you tweak this close gap setting right here. When using the fill tool, you also get these same two controls. So if your lines are clean enough, you don't even have to use the magic wand tool and you can just use the bucket. With the mask in place, I added a new clipping layer on top of it and painted in some rough lighting. The plan was to have half of his body be in this direct light from the top and the rest in shadow. To make this look more believable, I added this large diagonal light ray in the background right behind the silhouette. And as a secondary light, I added some bluish light coming from the direction of the camera right there. So this just helps better bring out the forms of the rest of his body that's in the shadow from the top light. <laughs> 13 year old Shala didn't know a thing about lighting, only shading. But without light, there is no shadow. And over the last few years, I've started preferring to paint light instead of shadow. I mean, in the end, it's a matter of preference anyways. But if you've only done shading so far in your art journey, try painting light. See how that feels. You may just prefer it. So the third step was a quick and dirty ambient occlusion pass. And the fourth was some red ambient light to blend them in with the environment better. I'll rewind the process a bit here to something I did between working on the light passes. I thought having just simple rocks in the background looked a bit bland. So to bring some character to the piece, I thought it would be cool to have some of these rocks glow as if they were blazing hot. <laughs> Obviously, this isn't how they look in the final. Uh, I just marked the possible positioning of these special rocks to get back to it later. But yeah, back to the present. To help myself with the color scheme of this piece, I was referencing a professional illustration by another artist. For copyright reasons, I can only show a blurry version of it in this video. But when I compared it with my artwork, this other piece used the saturated red way more sparingly, causing it to have like a bigger impact overall. I used the eyedrop from Death desktop feature. So if you go to edit and press pick screen color, you can use the eyedropper tool anywhere on any of your displays. I picked this less saturated tone from the reference piece and painted over my sky with it to help bring out this newly added red light ray. At this point, I was far enough in the process to start the rendering on top of everything on a single layer while picking colors from all layers underneath. So first I focused only on the dragon. At this stage, I was figuring out what level of detail would be appropriate when he isn't very close to the camera, but still is the main focus of the image. You know what I mean? I attempted to introduce some scales by erasing out parts of the light layers to generate shadows. Next, I rendered out the cliff more, figuring out how to not make it boring, how to balance large and small rocks so that it would have like an interesting balance. At one point, I discovered that I was working too zoomed in and wasn't seeing the big picture. So when I zoomed out, some bigger structural and color changes were made. When zoomed out, I also figured out I should brighten the main light ray. I used the glow dodge blending mode to achieve a nice bright look. 
So here's another lesson, which is something that I've been aware of for a long time, but it hasn't really clicked properly until recently. And that is working at different zoom levels. When you're zoomed out, you see the big picture and are correcting big problems. But when you're zoomed in, you're correcting small problems. It's that simple. But you'd be surprised how often I forget about this and <laughs> get carried away in some smaller details too early. Wait a minute, wait, 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 hold up, hold up. Not your turn yet. Bonus tip. My dumb ass completely forgot to do this, but if you want to avoid my mistake, you can always add a second window of the same drawing on the side. Simply go to Window, Canvas, and press New Window. Put this anywhere and it will update in real time as you make brush strokes in the main window. So this way you always have a zoomed out view. The shapes and angles of the rocks felt good now, but something was still too boring about it. I switched back to the dragon for a bit to give my mind some rest. Quick tip, take breaks, small and big. It will cause revelations and breakthrough moments, I guarantee you. I attempted to brighten some areas between the dragon's scales, but it wasn't properly reading, so I just ended up switching back to the background once again. Now, I did some more rendering all over it, but color-wise, it still felt too monotone. I used the linear light blending mode to bring some more blue tones to the shadows, helping solidify the blue camera light that was present on the dragon already, and enhance the orange light on the sides of the cliff. It did make a difference but it was kind of small but i just uh, decided to ignore it for a bit and just carry on with the rendering for a bit starting to introduce some textures and such on the cliff just starting to get to a more detailed level anyways i jumped back to working on the dragon for a bit as you've <laughs> noticed by now i constantly jump back and forth between the two elements of the image it's kind of like taking micro breaks while you're working on the same canvas anyways i brought some more color variation to his wings, introducing some refraction effects. When you look at the leaves of a tree on a sunny day, they can be either light or dark green. If the top side of the leaf is receiving light from the sun and you're seeing the bottom side, to you it will appear light green. So that's basically what's happening with the color of the back wing here. Anyways, I jumped back again to work on the background and this time went in with some color dodge to further amp up the color differences. So yeah, the image was starting to come together but I felt like more could be done with the atmosphere. I started adding in more elements like a meteor in the sky, some more smoke in the foreground, which I also tinted blue for that nice duo color scheme. Big brain moment. And finally, I went in heavy with the glow dodge blending mode and made some of those rocks glow as I intended to earlier. I had to be careful to not make it look like lava because that's not what I wanted. But yeah, I think I pulled it off pretty well actually. Actually. Finally, it was time to put in some work on that apocalyptic red sky. I started the process out with some simple cloud brushes and then started rendering on top of them with a regular round brush. While painting these clouds, I got into the flow state for the first time throughout working on this entire image. It's basically because I tend to work in short bursts, like 20 to 40 minutes at a time. But this time I had a nice one and a half hour session going. It was 3 a.m and I was vibing, freehanding these clouds. Anyways, I was quite satisfied with the result. And at this point, everything was established and fine detail rendering could begin. For the most part, I have a pretty versatile setup complete with two macro pads for shortcuts while I'm painting. There can never be enough macros, you know what I'm saying? But a big limitation I have is the color accuracy of my main monitor. It's a budget monitor and red tones are especially weak on it, which is the main color of this painting. Normally, I use a regular screenless tablet, but I thought I should switch to my screen tablet to finish this image off as it has way better colors. I switched to this alternative setup, which is probably a lot more similar to what most of my viewers are working with. And this is where the Clip Studio Paint mobile app comes to help. It can essentially become a versatile macro pad by using the companion mode. To set it up, make sure your computer and phone are connected to the same Wi-Fi. Go to the file menu and press connect to smartphone. On your phone, press get started started. The one hour daily limit doesn't apply when using companion mode, so you can just ignore that. So scan the QR code and you're ready to roll. Companion mode has various tabs here on the bottom for different types of controls, but perhaps the most powerful one is the quick access menu. Any brush, control, or tool can be dragged here and you'll be able to trigger it from your phone while painting on your tablet. So what I did as a starting point was drag my most commonly 
used brushes here. However, the tab I found myself on most of the time was the color plus brush settings tab, as I'm constantly changing the size of my brush while painting. Another very useful tab is the gesture pad, which allows you to zoom, pan, and rotate your canvas if your tablet has no touch support like mine. It just feels nice and responsive. Now, I did some fine detailing on the setup, just rendering some more rocks and putting in some more fine details into areas that should be finely detailed until my phone battery ran out. <laughs> so make sure your phone is charged when you want to use this feature. Huge shout out to Clip Studio Paint for supporting the channel, sponsoring this video, and yeah, I can really wholeheartedly recommend it. I've been using it as my daily driver for the last one and a half years already. It's got a whole bunch of features, and most importantly, it's extremely stable. So try it out for three months free on basically any platform using the link in the description below. That's about it. I'll see you guys next time.